Mr. Troy Griffin, please report to the uh, booth immediately. Good morning, everyone. Well, thank you for coming out to celebrate our 26th anniversary, 26th anniversary of the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health. And it falls around the time of Christmas and Hanukkah, so happy Hanukkah to those of you who are celebrating. At this time, I would really like to just thank you for all the support you have given us over the past 26 years. 26 years, as I mentioned, is a long time. And we haven't come here just by not doing something right over the years. And I think it has been a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of partnerships and some of those will be celebrated today as we move on in our program. When Arthur founded the Institute, he really, he really wanted us to concentrate on health inequities because there are those inequities that still exist within our communities today, and we really need to pay attention to those things. And so we have done that through our community outreach programs that you've heard us talk about time and time again. We have done that through our Health Science Academy, our program for high school students so that we can increase people of color in the health professions. As you know, the statistics are so daunting when we think about where we have been years ago and where we are now, and we look at black men and we don't have a lot of black male physicians, and we are still at the same place we were 
over 20 years ago. So we know that things have to be done and we need to move forward with that. And we can only do that through the partnerships that we have created. So we have created partnerships here at SUNY Downstate. Arthur was intentional in finding the institute and starting the institute at SUNY Downstate Medical Center because he realized that there were health inequities that needed to be addressed. In addition to being a champion on the court, he was a champion for human rights. He was also an activist and we work in that same spirit and that same vein in terms of looking at social justice and looking at the work that we do through a social justice lens. And we continue to promote Arthur's legacy in all the work that we do. And I, and I know that today you'll hear from some of our community partners. We have a nice program set aside for you. You will hear from our community partners. You'll hear from an alum of the Health Science Academy. And you'll also hear from some of our partners, our partners here at SUNY Downstate uh, Medical Center. And as I mentioned with partnerships, one of the key partners, partnerships that we have developed at the center to address health disparities has been the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center and we have created that in collaboration with, a, with SUNY Downstate Medical Center as well as, as the office of the Brooklyn Borough President. And that stands out as a real unique partnership that addresses health disparities through community outreach, through education, through research and training. So at this time, so that we can get into our program, you'll hear from me throughout and I, I don't want you to keep on hearing just my voice. So at this time, I'll call on our chair of our board, Mr. Brett Wright, to bring you greetings on behalf of the board of directors of the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health. Good morning, good morning. Uh, happy to be here, good looking crowd here. Um, so on behalf of the board, I wanna thank you guys all for coming out today. This is uh, always one of those things I mark on my calendar early to come out and get perspective on uh, how important the Institute has been in the community and the work that Marilyn and the team do every day. So uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm going to be very, very brief. Um, I also want to acknowledge a couple of friends in the audience. Uh, don't look that way. It's a couple of friends. There's two of you. I only have two friends, and I'm glad y'all are here. Uh, they have a long history with the Institute, uh, Dr. Ruth Brown and Dr. Eddie Mandeville. Uh, both uh, who have mentored me uh, in, in, in the Institute and getting me up to speed and had the, uh, the great fortitude and... Uh, foresight to handcuff me and put me in a headlock and put me in this position. Uh, but they haven't left my side, as you can see, they're here today to continue to support me uh, and allow me to uh, move the mission of the Institute forward and continue to do the great work. So uh, thanks again. I now have the pleasure of introducing uh, Kedrin Gwynn, Dr. Kedrin Gwynn, who is a Senior VP and Chief of Staff. So, thank you. Get your Good morning. It's always my pleasure to be here, obviously, on behalf of the institution, on behalf of Downstate. Um, Brett didn't see, Brett didn't see uh, Drs. Brown and Mandeville needing to be separated, so I don't know what that's about, but we welcomed, welcomed them back to Downstate as well, <laughs> Eddie being uh, one of our faculty members here. So we're happy to have all of you guys here. We also welcome Dr. Coleman from NYU. So thank you for coming and thank you for being our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Riley talks about this partnership in a very special way. It's, it's a partnership obviously that started here under Arthur Ashe himself. So we appreciate everything that Arthur did for Downstate, everything he's done for health inequities, et cetera. Um, but we are certainly uh, delighted to have had the opportunity to be the recipient of the Arthur Ashe Institute. And we're just happy that you know, we can continue his legacy, continue to work to eradicate health inequities. And our faculty, our students, all of us, we do a job, we do the job of eradicating those uh, inequities. And we're just happy to, to have this lecture, to continue this lecture. And we're happy, again, that you're here, and I will be brief as well. So I'm gonna be briefer than you, and I'm gonna sit down now. So thank you, welcome to Downstate. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Gwen. Thank you, Brett. At this time, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Kathleen Powderly, who is in the John Conley Division of Medical Ethics and Humanities, and that's the division in which Arthur founded the Institute. So I'd like to ask Dr. Powderly to come to the podium at this time. Good morning. 26 years ago, in conjunction with World AIDS Day, Arthur Ashe came to Downstate and sat in our cafeteria launched the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health. The cafeteria looks pretty much the same. Um, he came here at the invitation of the Reverend Dr. Paul Smith, who was his pastor and also a faculty associate of our division, which was relatively new at that time. Um, and I still remember Arthur in the playroom in, in pediatrics, sitting at this tiny little table on a chair and talking to this little girl about how he had recently been in the hospital and how many IVs he had had. Uh, we're very fortunate, and I think Arthur would be very proud of the fact that Ruth and Marilyn have taken his vision for urban health and that it continues to this day. The division is about, it's now the John Conley Division of Medical Ethics and Humanities, and we'll celebrate its 30th anniversary next year. I was six when, when the division started. Um, so, and I am, I'm really uh, thrilled that we continue to collaborate as we pursue Arthur's vision for urban health and how to deal with health disparities. So welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Powderly. At this time, I would like you to hear from some of our community partners, and so I'll call all of those that are going to be a part of our panel to join us on stage. It will be a brief conversation in terms of what we have done and how, what the Institute had meant, has meant over the years to various people. So I'll ask all of those uh, folks who are part of this to come on stage at this time. So as you know, the Institute does a lot of work within the community. We go to meet people where they are, in beauty salons, in barber shops. We also do a lot of work with schools across Brooklyn. And so we have our Health Science Academy, and you would, today you'll hear from an alum of the academy. You'll also hear from one of the barbers that has participated with the Institute for a number of years. And you'll also hear from one of our stylists that has been a part of the Institute. And Dr. Tenye Black well is our director of community engagement and research and she'll facilitate a brief conversation with these folks good morning thanks for coming to our anniversary lecture so my name is dr. Tanya Blackwell and I am the director of community engagement and research at the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health and with me, I have a few of our community members and alum from our Health Science Academy to just share with us briefly um, some of the work and just to display some of the partnership and the endeavor that we do here at the Arthur Ashe Institute. Um, I will say that a lot of the community engagement work that we do is, is, is built off of the community empowerment model and that model, and with that, we believe that um, communities that are engaged, um, inclusive, uh, confident, knowledgeable, and organized uh, can become great agents of change. And this is why we do a lot of our work in the community, in barber shops and hair salons. Um, I, I came across something briefly I would like to share um, as I came on as a staff at Arthur Ashe of the history that barbers played in caring for the health matters of individuals. And um, something that I read that I thought was interesting that in that era, and they were referring to the 1800s, surgery was seldom done by physicians. They were done by barbers, um, given that they had blades and knives and cutting tools, um, and they cared for the soldiers during and after war. And so barbers played a really, really key role in addressing and caring for the health of the community. And so I'm going to talk to our barber who we have here with us, Desmond Romeo. And I would like to uh, first ask you to share with everyone um, 
where your shop is, how long you've been involved with the Arthur Ashe Institute and in what way, and how that has um, impacted your role as a barber and the customers that you serve and the community members that you serve. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Desmond Romeo. I am the sole proprietor of Dr. Cuts. We are located at 620 Flatbush Avenue. We, about a month ago, we moved from 612 due to the fact that different changes within the community that we all know concerning new people coming in. So we had to briefly move from our old location to where we are at now. The old location, we were there for approximately 17 years. And within that 17 year span, we were working with the Arthur Ashe Institute for about 15 years. Just about, it, it has been a beautiful situation whereas they come into the establishment, meet us, get to know the technicians and stuff. And again, we are not barbers anymore. We are now hair technicians. So. Duly noted. Duly noted. Duly so, noted. <laughs> so, you know, they came in, they met the barbers, and the strategy basically was to enlighten the barbers on what's happening in the community. A lot of different things were, I would say, just dormant, you know, not being discussed. And a lot of the barbers took the initiative to get the enlightenment, share the work, share all the different ideas, share the, the different strategies of how we could get to the community and make sure we enlighten them to what's happening. The first, one of the first topics that we discussed was hypertension. A lot of people didn't understand what it was. The Arthur Ashe Institute came in, Dr. White, Brunel. It was a good situation because I myself have my own testimony concerning that issue. I looked at stuff like uh, the influence of our community concerning, for instance, I was born in Trinidad, and coming here, looking at how, how we eat has so much to do with how we, our culture has so much influence on our survival. We're concerning, a lot of times we try to do things according to what we were trained, but you have to pull yourself away from that and try to incorporate new ideas, new different types of delicacies, try to eat more greens, stuff like that, because me personally, I will eat doubles every day. I don't know if you know what doubles is, but it's flour-based. So now, with the enlightenment, with these guys coming in, sharing their ideas and their strategies with us, now we're starting to eat more healthy, spreading the word, enlightening our clients. Um, so it's been a, a process. And with the understanding of the new information that we've got, we have a good relationship with our clients. We try to enlighten them also to eat better, to exercise, stuff like that. And me personally, again, I have changed my whole life concerning with the Arthur Ashe Institute, working with these people. I am now a beacon. My business is an information incubator, and we share the word to the community, making sure black men, and men in part, because a lot of men think I'm macho, I don't have to check myself, I don't have to be proactive. So we spread the word, and we let them know, and this is a beautiful situation. Hopefully, coming forward, we get the proper amount of resources, finances to keep this going through the community. Because this is big. This is big. It's large. And it's well needed. Okay, guys? So, thank you. Awesome. Give it up for our barber surgeons. <laughs> our hair technician. Miss <laughs> um, Hermie. So, Miss Hermie is going to tell you a little bit about herself and her salon um, and where she's located and how long she's been um, involved with the Arthur Ashe Institute, how it came about, and which program were you and your salon a part of? Hi, my name is Hermione Fraser. I'm a hairstylist for 36 years. I have my salon, it's on Church Avenue and Brooklyn Avenue. I got involved with the Arthur Ashe Institute maybe about 18 years or more. Um, it was very influential to me and my clients. Uh, the first program we did was the, I thought it was the breast cancer. We, we did the breast cancer program. And my clients will come into the salon. They will look at the tapes. That time they had videos. And they will look at it. And then... They will say, oh, Hermie, what's that all about? I said, well, you know, you have to go to the doctor, take care of yourself, test your breast. And they brought in a, um, 
one of the breasts to, so my clients could test and see what they have to look for in doing the breast um, exam. So we did that, and a few days after, one of my clients called and said, oh, I mean, you know, I went to the doctor, and look, I find out I have breast cancer. I said, wow. She said, oh, if you didn't have that program in the shop, I wouldn't even bother to look at that. So I said, that was really great. I like that, you know, you took the initiative of going to the doctor. And for me personally, there was another program, the sleep study. So I said, the sleep study, I said, you know what, let me take part in it too. So we fill up the forms and everything. And there and behold, I was, I was one of the candidates for the sleep study. And I found out I have sleep acne. I said, wow. I said, Ada Ash didn't work only for my clan, but for me personally. And I was really grateful that now I could sleep better <laughs> with the snow in. So, and I like the program is that it keep a good conversation in the salon with the, um, with the clients. I always tell him, I said, health first. I said, we have to do something about our health. We need to take our, our pressure daily. I give them instructions. There is a booklet that they print and I usually give it out to the clients and they said it's very informative for them. They like that. And we do a lot of stuff in the salon. I tell him, if you cannot trust, trust your hairdresser, who could you trust? <laughs> because um, I was reading a book and this guy, John, John Steinbeck, and he said, hairdressers are one of the most influential people in the community. The clients, they trust you. They tell you everything. Things that they don't tell, tell the doctor, they tell you. And I loved, love the fact that I have so many people around me that we could talk and discuss what, you know, the health is all about. And I tell them I am in a business for health care. And they said, health care? I said, yes, I'm not here for home care when you get sick to take care. You have to prevent that. You know, we all have to get sick, but there is something we could do to prevent that happening. Eat better, you know, exercise more and, you know, do the right thing. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Hermine. So if you've been paying attention to the education world, you'll see that everything now is about STEM education. STEM, STEAM, STEM, and as a product of, a, you know, a science kid and a STEM kid, one of the things that I'm, also most proud of with the Arthur Ashe Institute is that the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health has been in STEM education for decades, you know, while the world is now jumping on STEM education and pushing STEM and the importance of STEM, we've been in the, f the work of STEM education with our students, the Health Science Academy, you know, training the next generation of medical and health professionals, particularly for minority communities. And so we have with us um, one of our alum, who was a part of the Health Science Academy. Marcos is here with us today. And so Marcos, if you could share with us how you came about, how did you learn about the Arthur Ashe Institute and the Health Science Academy, and what impact has it made on you and your education and career, if you can share with us. Uh, good morning, everybody. I learned from the academy, do the, they have a partnership with my high school, National Regional High School, and they kind of recruit me from there. It was an application process I applied, and thankfully I was able to get in. In terms of how it had impacted me, or how it had helped me, my personal growth, and all this other, um, all my other academic growth, even though that we're moving towards the STEM programs, uh, unfortunately, local, infor unfortunately, high schools do not offer a lot of science classes, or a lot of science opportunities and a lot of students lag in these areas and whenever they get to college they have a lot of difficulties overcoming these problems. So just a simple fact that being involved in science, having this experience, having like a little bit of career prep and formal prep definitely prepare me. Besides that, uh, the dissections, like all the dissections we do since we get right away, uh, the sheep ears, fetal pig, the heart, all these dissections whenever you get to college that's the first thing you do in biology. And a lot of students struggle with that, but having the ex previous experience here in the academy, I was able to uh, be successful and like help others. So that's definitely an important aspect. Uh, 
other things that I like, uh, how it has prepared me, like whenever, how it has impacted me, I feel that one of the reasons that I want to go into medicine in particular is because I learned of the glaring healthcare disparities that exist in our nation and how they usually affect minority, minorities, people of color, Hispanics, and I think that everyone, regardless of race, color, should deserve equal and, um, equal and a great uh, treatment in terms of medicine. Uh, also like that, the academy is always looking uh, for opportunities to grow up, and opportunities not as stagnant. Uh, when I, w I went to college, I wasn't aware that, even though I had an 80% uh, scholarship, I wasn't aware that every year uh, the tuition went up like $1,000 or like four or five percent, something like that. And however, now like the academy does a great job in having many different career workshops, having def many different workshops on preparing you. I think Dr. Bauman's leadership and mentorship has been great. For example, recently she went to a conference, a public health conference, and then as soon as she came back, she's like, hey Marco, I heard that now there is a lot of um, mental health issues with college students, they're being more open. And also there is a lot of issues with sexual abuse on campus. Do you know anything about that? And, I, and I, we would talk a little bit and then she was like, okay, let's have one of those workshops ready for the fall because I want to prepare up our students and I want them to be more ready. Um, anything else? <laughs> oh, my career? Oh, definitely like in terms of career, once again, the mentorship, not only from the Health Science Academy itself, but also from the other parts of the institute. Uh, I know that I could always come for them and ask them professional uh, questions and like see how I should go about things. But definitely like inspire and motivate me to have a career in medicine. Um, uh, oh, right now I'm like one of the senior consultants, I guess, senior advisors. So uh, in the summer I helped run uh, one of the summer, re summer research programs that we have in partnership with Sony Downstate and the Department of Pathology here. Um, it's called REACH. It's basically research intensive uh, in neurology and autism that we do with Dr. Alarcon. That's what I do in the summer and then during the year I just kind of work with all the instructors, work with them and also I teach a few classes, um, all, a few classes here and there. So you've come full circle. You were a student in HSA and now uh staff of Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health. Great, um, so I mean this pretty much wraps up our discussion. I uh, would like to um, implore Desmond and Ms. Hermie to continue to keep up the good work in being change agents in the community as you are, um, helping us to understand the types of information and the ways in the ways to reach the community with information. And you two are, you're there, and you're out there, and you're in the trenches with the community, and knowing the slang and the lingo and the innuendos and how to reach people with health, important health information. So we appreciate you with that. And uh, I'll be in touch this week about our next project, okay? <laughs> um, and Marcos, um, congratulations to you and your endeavors in science and STEM education. And um, it's a pleasure working with you here at the Institute. Thank you all. So thank you all once again for that. And you can get a chance to speak to any of these individuals after as we break later on for lunch. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, but before I do that, you have heard about some of the work that we have done in the Institute in the Sleep Apnea Project, and that was part of the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center. And today we have my co-director of the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center, Dr. Mauro Salafu here. And so I'll just say, Mauro, if you can just wave. <laughs> And Dr. P Pamela Straker, who is the administrator for this center. So we thank them for being here. At this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Lisa Coleman, who is at New York University, and she's an inaugural senior VP for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation, and also the Chief Diversity Officer, and she's responsible for advancing the strategic global inclusion goals of, of the institute. 
One of the things Dr. Coleman has spent over 20 years teaching and working with numerous organizations. She's also served on many boards, including the USTA, which is dear to our heart. As, and she is a recipient of numerous recognitions and awards for teaching and for her leadership. And so today I just w would like to welcome her to Downstate, welcome her to, uh, to this event, and, and welcome her to the podium as she brings the keynote address for today. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Let me just get organized. Yes, okay. So thank you to the organizers. As a person who uh, works on organizing events, I know how uh, the efforts that it takes to put things like this together. So thank you very much. Um, and so thank you to Marilyn and uh, to Ruth and others, to Brett and uh, Kendron and Kathleen. I see there are lots of names here, and Tenya, and of course to our panelists. I would also like to just take a moment, um, to take a moment of silence to acknowledge the land upon which we stand, the ancestors that work brought us here, and also to honor those people in Alaska right now who are struggling after the aftermath of the most recent hurricane. Thank you very much. I misspoke, not hurricane, Kane. I meant to say earthquake. Uh, I'm Lisa Coleman, and um, as has been said a little bit about me, I think the, uh, I'll connect to the panel here. I started off as a major in computer science, so I'm deeply committed, committed to the STEAM project. Um, I also worked for the Association of American Medical Colleges. It was my first role outside of my college education. I worked there for five years. I'm doing demographic research and studying medical education across the United States. And I say it's one of the things that brought me back to higher ed many years later. And as, of course, was mentioned, I currently serve in the United States Tennis Association Board, although I'm rolling off. Uh, I've served on that board for the last uh, six years with the first African-American president of that board, Katrina Adams. And it's been a pleasure to work with her and other members. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about health, health disparities, diversity and inclusion, some things hopefully I'll, and maybe we'll have some questions. So today's uh, talk, and, and part of the reason I've uh, titled the talk the way that I have is because Cornell West wrote a book called Race Matters, and then Bell Hooks followed up with another book called Class Matters. So today I've entitled my talk Health Matters, because if we don't have health, we don't have anything. We actually can't engage anything because we need to be alive, as it turns out. So the American Anthropological Association has made it clear that human populations are demarcated, that we are maybe, that there was a lot of conversation in the early part of the 16th 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries uh, around biological determinism and especially around eugenics and whether humans across racial categories, etc., were the same biologically. So in 1999, the American Anthropological Association made a statement and said, we're the same. There's some little fine differences, but basically black people, white people, Women, men, were kind of the same. So that's what this slide says. Why does health matter? Well, I've already said we have to live. And what we know is we have great disparities in health. The World Health Organization defines health disparities as the differences in health outcomes that, closely, that are closely linked with social and economic and environmental disadvantages. And they're often driven by social conditions. Martin Luther King has this quote, of all the forms of inequality and justice, 
Healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Because if we cannot care for those who are at the margins of our society and thinking about how we help people through the most vulnerable times of their life, this is truly a question of social justice. The leading health disparities, which I know many of you are familiar with, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, HIV, AIDS, infant mortality, asthma, mental health, and as we know across race, gender, ability, age, et cetera, the disparities run rampant. In my early years, one of the things that I did in the 80s and 90s is that I actually worked in Dallas, Texas, in community centers, um, in, with AIDS and HIV pa patients. In those days, we, they called it the buddy system. And you would go into hospitals and actually provide services for people who had been infected with HIV. One of the things that I remember most poignantly from that time is that across Dallas, Texas, what I would see is that people who were members of marginalized populations, those who were poor, those who were members of African-American descent, and those who were of Latin descent would not receive the same kinds of services and support services at that time. I was a teenager then, and it was at that time that I'd made a decision about my life and what I would do with my life, and that I would dedicate my life to helping those who are more marginalized than I. And when we think about these health care disparities, what we see across these differences is it doesn't matter whether there's infant mortality and we think about the rates of black women who are highly educated and the rates of infant mortality in those cases or the disproportionate misdiagnoses in terms of melanoma and cancer and skin disease. We see these disparities and we know that these are rampant and relevant to our social condition. As I've already um, highlighted, racial genetics do not explain these disparities. The history of eugenics, and certainly in the United States and in Europe, and I actually used to teach courses on this, is, is, is very pernicious and still remains as part of the medical discourse that, uh, around the difference in the human condition. So whether it's maternal mortality, birth weight, life expectancy, what we know are the stressors, et cetera, that are put on people across different populations have relevant impact to their health outcomes. I, as a person who have um, lived this life, um, older maybe than I look, I don't know how I look, but, um, and so one of the things that we have all noticed is when we think about stressors and particularly, and one of the most interesting facts, and a friend of mine, uh, Kaylon Taylor Clark, who used to actually be at the Brookings Institute he heading up their racial and ethnic disparities um, division, actually wrote several papers about the um, war, the, this effect, and particularly um, the education of black women. And women who are, uh, as it turns out, Black women who, the more education they have, the higher their infant mortality rates. So the more education, the higher the infant mortality rates. And to some degree, that bucks what people initially thought, right? It goes against the norm and the grain. Because the idea is the more educated you are, the more access you'll have to health care. So what this actually indicates is it goes back to those stressors. And what are those stressors that might be placed upon particular groups when you think about women, and particularly women of African descent? Other examples of disparities in medical diagnoses, we have uh, Hispanic and Latino patients with long, uh, uh, bone fractures twice as likely uh, to receive no ED or pain medication, and this is across various racial and ethnic categories. Um, this is obviously true with people of African descent. We also know that um, people of African descent and Latin descent are less likely to be screened for cholesterol levels. Health matters because it's also an economic burden. $1.24 trillion. That was the combined cost of health inequities for premature death in the United States between 2003 and 2006. That's just three years. And if these trends continue and the rising costs and impact to our GDP, and most importantly, the impact in real people's lives, one, these are, but these can be mediated, and I'm going to talk a little bit in a moment about how. 
So Arthur Ashe said most people, and I have to say Arthur Ashe obviously was much smarter than I. I did not learn that people were resistant to change until about four years ago. <laughs> and um, there's actually some HR data that demonstrates this and it, uh, I was in an HR presentation and in that HR presentation, um, they said these statistics and they said 88% of people hate change. 6% of people like it just a little bit. Then the other 6%, then you had like 3% who liked it and then 3% who you know, sometimes liked it, sometimes didn't. So when I heard these statistics, I was like, are you trying to tell me I'm in another minority group? <laughs> I'm in that 3% and I didn't even know it. So, but obviously Arthur Ashe knew it. Most people are resistant to change even when, it is, when, the, when it, it, there's the promise or the premise that it's gonna be better. Change will come. And it's the question of whether we're gonna acknowledge it. So part of what I am talking about here is demography is shifting. Who we are as a nation is shifting. And we've seen some of the backlash as a result of some of the most recent issues emerging. Health and healthcare impacts everyone and health disparities relate to our overall GDP and the health of the nation. The indicators of a community health or a nation's health have to do with, how, have to do with health disparities, inequalities, and health inequities. This speaks to the health of a nation. And if we think about our nation, we're not doing so well. When we contrast and compare ourselves to our other developed nations, we actually don't have universal health care. I was just in South Africa, and I became ill while I was there. I was in Cape Town, so I had to go because I actually have had several knee surgeries. For those of you in the audience, I had an ostonomy. Not that when you look that surgery up, it shows dogs. Um, so I had my knee broken and my legs broken in several places, and then screws put in and put back together. Yeah, I see some people's faces. And um, <laughs> it was a very long process. Um, but what we know is that these kinds of surgeries, et cetera, right, are expensive. And we have to think about who can have access to those kinds of surgeries, right? And I had very good health care. I used to work for an institution called Harvard University. That's why I had those surgeries there. But recently I was in South Africa, and as a result of these surgeries, I have to have my legs examined for blood clots when I go on long flights. And so I ran into the hospital in South Africa and said, could you please give me an ultrasound on my legs really quickly? And they said, yes, of course. Could you just give us 300 rand? And I said, yes, of course. Thank you so much. And I left. <laughs> I would like to suggest that in the United States, it would have taken a lot more for that to happen, including multiple insurance cards, etc. I have been left on gurneys. My first surgery, I was left on a gurney for two hours because I had been taking Percocet and the doctors assumed I was a drug addict and left me on the gurney until my other friend from Harvard University showed up and explained who I was. Health matters and equity. Health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this. It is a counter to health disparity or inequities. So for me, I do a lot of work in this space called inclusion, diversity, belonging, and equity. And so I have this friend and colleague, her name is Verna Myers, and Verna Myers was just hired as the senior diversity and inclusion officer for Netflix. So now I get a lot of movies for free. And Verna did a TED Talk, and in the TED Talk she defined these things. And so in the TED Talk what she says is diversity is defined as demography. And what she says is that's people at a dance. And so if you think about a dance, right, and I went to single sex schools as a younger person. Um, and so when you're, when you're my age and you go to single sex schools, what happens is the girls line up on one side of the room and the boys line up on the other side of the room. And it's even worse than that. 
the girls who are the geek girls, that would be me when I was a child. I was in that group, very proudly happy. I didn't even know I was a geek. I was just there. Then there was the sports group, and then there was the cool group, right? I thought I was in the cool group, by the way. And, right, and, so, and then on the other side of the room, right, is the same, right, sort of lineup in some ways, right? The girls and boys didn't really dance together that much in these formal settings, right? So you had diversity in the room, but nobody talking to each other. And what Verna says is inclusion is actually when you have people actually engaging, right? Maybe dancing, talking to each other. My additions are belonging is when you're part of that constitutional foundation. It's when you're actually at the dance and you can actually contribute to the playlist or if you don't contribute to it, you can make fun of it. You can say that playlist is terrible, but you can do it in a loving way because you're part of the fabric of the community. And equity is about the equitable distribution. And this is not about equality, right? Equality is different than equity. And equity actually looks at the history of differential treatments. So when we think about IDB or inclusion, belonging, diversity, and equity solutions, what we have to think about is where can we be most effective in thinking about transforming whether it's healthcare or other kinds of institutions. So the first, as you see at the bottom of this pyramid, is addressing socioeconomic caste. Certainly in the United States, we often don't like to think about that we have class or caste systems. I would like to suggest that we do. And I would like to suggest that in many ways, they're more pernicious than some of our European partners because they remain unnamed and unclaimed. So when we're addressing the socioeconomic caste, one of the things we have to do is address structures, right? And those structures that are built in class, class and stratified structures. Those are educational structures, those are access structures, and really thinking about how we break down neighborhoods, if we think about the work of Massey in terms of banking loans, et cetera, and the dis, um, uh, excuse me, segregation of neighborhoods based on banking loans. So really thinking about how we develop programs that help people move through how you get a loan, how you move through neighborhoods, how you access resources. Disparities in targeted health programming, and I heard some of this obviously um, from, the, from some of the panelists. So how do we develop more um, enhanced outreach programs, whether that's K through 12, barbershops, salons, et cetera. And then lastly, how do we think about transforming a culture, which has to do with transforming a culture to cultural competency. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So the first thing I'd like to say is really we have to think about how do we develop inclusive literacy and leadership models. And the six traits that are identified are commitment, courage, cognizant of bias, curiosity, cur cur uh, excuse me, uh, cultural intelligence, and collaboration. The one thing that I will say here, and I'll come back to these when I talk later about Arthur Ashe and some other people, is that the key about the cognizant of bias. So one of the things that we talk a lot about, uh, and has, uh, certainly has come, has emerged from the work of Daryl Wing Sue um, from UCLA and his work on microaggressions, and Mazarin Banaji and Anthony, Mazarin Banaji is at Harvard University, came out of Ohio State University, and Anthony Greenwald, who's at uh, the Ohio State University, and they do work on unconscious bias, their book called The Good Intentions. And of course, there's been a lot of attention to this work on unconscious bias. And what I would like to suggest here is that I'm less interested in the work of unconscious bias as it pertains to individuals as, and more interested in how bias gets put into structures. So a lot of my work, and this comes from the work of by a woman by the name of Iris Bonet, who's actually looked at how bias gets implemented into structures. So let me give you a very clear example. If you think about training in medical school and the kinds of training that people have, right, and you think about the, the training on cadavers, and some of you will remember this, you're old enough, uh, I, I started my training. A lot of the initial training was done on male bodies, right? And so we think about the differences in cardiovascular disease, men and women, right? If you study the hearts only of men, you get answers about men's hearts, right? So we really have to think about how bias can get put into a structure 
and then what those outcomes might be if that bias is part of the structure. Does that make sense? And that, that's what I mean about being cognizant of bias. Now there's cognizant of bias like my own individual bias. Good luck to you all in that. I hope you, know, you can take the tests, et cetera. But really when we're talking about training in systems and transforming a system, it's about where do those biases appear in the structures. The workforce. The good news is the healthcare workforce is already more diverse than a lot of the other sites. Certainly more diverse than higher education, more diverse than the legal profession. That's just, those are just the facts. The bad news is that it's not exactly diverse in the highest levels of the profession, as was pointed out earlier in terms of black, physi black male physicians. And, and the other thing is that when you look at the numbers, even though it's 70%, that still leaves a lot of work to do if you think about the ways in which we represent populations across the board. So why is IDBE literacy important in the healthcare profession? Well, what we're seeing is stagnation. So what we're seeing is stagnation, and this was pointed out earlier in terms of enrollment in medical schools at the highest levels. What we're also seeing is more underrepresentation. And if these trends continue, what we will see is in the levels will stay the same, and what we're seeing is people are leaving the profession. Increasing the diversity in IDB training of the healthcare uh, workforce is, are two effective strategies for addressing healthcare disparities. What we also know is IDBA literacy improves access to healthcare for underserved patients. We know that African American, Latino, Hispanic, and Native American physicians are much more likely than their white counterpart physicians to practice in underserved communities. They're much more likely to treat patients irrespective of income. We know this data from the American uh, uh, Hospital Association data, and we know it from the AAMC. African American and Latino and Hispanic physicians, as well as women, are more likely to provide poor, provide care to the poor and those on Medicaid. We also know that IDBA literacy leads to increased racial and ethnic minority patient choice and satisfaction. They're more likely to select healthcare professionals from their own background and to trust them. We know that there are high levels of mistrust because the medical industry has not always played fair with people of color. We only need to think of Tuskegee. And unfortunately, that's all too relevant in too many people's imagination. Racial and ethnic minorities are generally more satisfied when they are engaged And it also helps with directed care. What we know is that IDBE literacy will lead to improved health care for all patients, not just those marginalized. What we know from the research is that when we care for those who are the most vulnerable in our society, everyone receives better care. And obviously, the growing literature across all diversity, education, and belonging literature points to the fact that we improve learning outcomes for all students, et cetera, such as skills and active in intellectual engagement. And as leading research indicates, encountering indicated, and interacting with individuals from across backgrounds during training will help you to be a better physician, a better doctor, build a better product, be a better educator, whatever it is. And attention to IDB in classrooms and teaching leads to better performance outcomes in the profession and across diverse groups. So lastly, what are the things that we need to pay attention to? Or not quite lastly, but. So we need to diversify, but it can't just be about the numbers, as I've already sort of alluded to. We really have to think about what kinds of training, what kinds of inclusive leadership models, and how are we transforming, transforming our organizations structurally? How are we identifying the bias? There's a test called the implicit bias test. You can actually look it up, the website, just type in Project Implicit into Google. 
project implicit, and you can take the test. The test will help you think about how to identify biases and then how to put, how to think about applying those in your own work. Hiring and search process, retention and promotion strategies. These seem so mundane. And yet what we know about hiring and search processes and retention and promotion is that whether it's gender, race, ethnicity, Women who, um, women in startups, so we think about women in startups and incubation. So let's say you want to do a startup lab and you want to um, get some uh, uh, external funding. Women are seven times less likely to receive the same exact funding as in their male counterpart. And this is work out of The Ohio State University. So if you have identical applications applying for funding, identical, and you change the name from a man to a, um, from a man to a woman, the woman is seven times less likely to receive funding. An African American whose name sounds after African American, I'm not quite sure what that means. I think Lisa Coleman doesn't sound that way, I don't know. That person must send in their resume eight to 11 times more for a job. They're eight, 11 times more likely to be rejected based on name alone. So when we're thinking about hiring and search processes and how bias enters into those processes, we also have to think about how we de-bias our processes. The one great thing about technology is there's new technology, they're developing algorithms that can help, so you can put your resume through them, you can put cover letters, letters of recommendation, and de-bias them. What we also know about letters of recommendation, and this is particularly uh, crucial in the sciences and in my field of higher education. So when letters of recommendation come, what we know are the differences between men and women. Men get described this way. He's a leader for the 22nd century. He will lead us boldly into the future. We do not know what we would do without him. She's a wonderful collaborator. We find that her work is really great. I just feel she's so nice every time I see her. And you know what? She's friends with my wife. I have taken these examples literally from the research, right? These are called hedges. And what happens in letters of recommendation is hedges are when women are described, they're described in much more soft terms, and then they're hedges. They're, they are they're adjectives before how they're described. They always wanna be nice, because women, socially, you want women to be nice. They're supposed to be collaborative. <laughs> Some people are laughing because they know I'm not nice, no. I, um, <laughs> All right, so we really have to think about those things, and that's why I say this mundane, these mundane things actually can prohibit, right, the movement and transform, transforming an organization. Retention and promotion strategies. One of the things that I did at my uh, previous institution is I studied a cohort of 15 years of people who had left the institution. Because I wanted to know why. Everyone always says that people leave the institution because they get a better job. Well, of course they do. <laughs> of course. But why did they leave? What could we have done to keep them? Do we have disproportionate numbers of people who are members of groups of people who have disabilities, members of LGBTQ groups, members of our indigenous groups? Are they leaving at disproportionate numbers? Then can we find out why? Scorecards. Uh, scorecards, oh gosh, all right, I'm almost done. Scorecards, diversity scorecards, also can be very important to help you analyze your organization. Get educated, train, language focus. This is really crucial when we think about the linguistic barriers. I am in, uh, I have taught sign language and, and re have re-immersed myself in an immersion sign language courses. And it's really important, I think, for us to think about how we communicate with one another, what kinds of languages, interpretive skills. This is really important in terms of patient care. 
and obviously relating to families in that space. Engage best practices. Now, I've included some of the best, the, the people, the AHA, the AMA, uh, et cetera. I see that one thing got cut off at the end, which are community local centers, because it's really important to involve the community local centers as we're thinking about healthcare opportunities. And I can't say enough about the work that Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health is doing. Thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing for the communities. As a former Brooklynite, thank you. I live in Manhattan, but I'm on my way back. So as I was thinking about Arthur Ashe today, I, I had a lot of feelings and thoughts, and one of the people that came to my mind was um, Colin Kaepernick. And, I, and because of one of the quotes that Arthur Ashe has, which is about athletes and what athletes have to offer to the world. And when I thought about these six traits of inclusive leadership, committed, courageous, courageous cognizant, curious, intellectually, uh, culturally aware, and collaborative, the two of them came to my mind as corner and bookstone, right, corner uh, book, bookends. There's a famous indigenous author, uh, Lila Watson, and she, her, she has a quote, and the quote reads like this. If you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound with mine, then come and let us work together. And I feel that Arthur Ashe and Colin Kaepernick might agree with that. So I end with that, Arthur Ashe. Of course, I had to use a tennis photo. I am on the USDA board. To achieve greatness, start where you are. Use what you have and do what you can. Now, today. Thank you very much. So we'd like to thank Dr. Lisa Coleman for that once more. And at this time, we are prepared to have a discussion. And I'll call up uh, Dr. Carla Booten Foster, who will join us on at stage right now. So Dr. Booten Foster serves as the Associate Dean of Diversity Education and Research here at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. And we'll have a little discussion that you can also participate in. So I'll just turn it over to Dr. Carla Booten Foster. Thank you so much, Carla. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman, for your talk. That was informative, inspiring, um, motivating, really. Well, thank thank you. you so much. And you, talked, you touched upon a lot of um, important topics, I think. Um, and I would like to start off with the question. So you started talking about genetics. Yes. And, and this whole concept of people focus on how different we are when indeed we are more similar than we think that we're different. And we focus on the differences. Um, so this, you know, as you was talking, I, I thought about race and how we tend to identify race. Yes. So I just wanted to pose the question to you. You've been doing this work for over 20 years. Race, how should we conceptualize race? Um, mm -hmm. Genetic, yep. social. Yep. Race is one of the most salient topics, uh, certainly of our time. And, and when I say of our time, I mean since the 16th century. And... <laughs> I mean, I'm an academic, so we, time for us is relative uh, up until the moment. And so I think that certainly, right, when we think of biology and genetics, right, there's been a lot of attention to the differences. But as I said, we're pretty much the same. But the reality is that has not been our social condition. That has not been the reality of how people have been treated since the 17th century, certainly here in the United States. And so, so when people talk about race being a social, social construction, that is very true. But social constructions are real. <laughs> and they are acted upon, and they are made real by those actions. And what I mean by that is if you think about when I talked about the resume differential, 
right? That, that association with a racialized name or the racialized other then has a real impact on then how you are received in society. So yes, race is a construct, and the ways we need to think about that construct have to do with the social, the social environment. But it is real in that it is acted upon, we see the real outcomes of that, and then when we think about the biological stressors, as I talked about, then they can have a real impact on our bodies. And as a result, right, if I'm constantly under stress, day in and day out, what kind of impact, and we know many of you are physicians, et cetera, in this room, that also has a real impact if I'm constantly under duress as, a re as it relates to my gender, my race, my ability, my sexual identity, identity and or orientation, et cetera. Thank you. Um, are there questions from the audience for Dr. Coleman? Yes. societal construct, how does the, all the current ra uh, rage about genetics and our genetic mm -hmm. origins impact that? Yes. Because if it were up to me, I w if one of the reasons they didn't make me king was I would have taken all those folks in Charlottesville and found out exactly what their blood, <laughs> what, what their genetics was, and we'd find out, we'd all be surprised, I'm sure. Yes. Well, and, oh, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because right, part of what we know from this genetics research is that we are a lot the same, right? When we look and think about how we, our genetic makeup, right? And so I think that's very important to think. Um, and certainly I, uh, uh, there was actually a very large project in the Science Museum in Massachusetts I'm, I'm, I'm fortunately, I cannot remember the name, but it was dedicated to really looking at this, the, um, what has happened in terms of the study of genetics over the last um, 15 to 20 years, particularly with the 123 project, et cetera, with Skip Gates, obviously, and that kind of work, and really thinking about, right, and I think that work really has demonstrated, right, the ways in which we are connected and the ancestry to which we are connected, and also, right, to go back where you started, race in these here United States is a racial construct that has some very real and pernicious histories that affect our present. And if you think about it this way, right, if I am um, a person of African descent and I move to the United States, Right? It only takes two to three generations, and this is true for all racial and ethnic minorities, for me to have the experience of those who have lived here under the duress of racial animus, ethnic and racial animus, et cetera, right? Do, do, does, does that make sense? Okay, so let me, let, me go, let me say that again. So unless you're living in a cl relatively cloistered community, all right, so there are cloistered communities, but if I'm a person, so let's say I'm a person who was born in Trinidad, okay, I'm a person of African descent born in Trinidad. There are pe people of Indian descent born in Trinidad as well, all right? So I'm a person of African descent born in Trinidad. I then move to the United States, and then I have children, and then they have children. That third generation of children, let's say I'm like 70 now, though my children right now would be having those, my grandchildren would be having that experience of what it has been like to be a black African-American person in the United States. Now, I may have raised them culturally and socially in one way, but once they leave my house, they're having that experience of what it means to encounter school systems, military systems, police systems, all those other kinds of systems based on phenotype and, and what people define as genetics. Are there other questions? Yes. I must say, you're, you're the greatest. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm big on enlightenment, right? And I like to understand certain things. I like to. Now, in the Flatbush area, where my store has been for so long, what I want to ask is, as an individual who is like a leader in my area, I am the president of the Merchant Association. I have taken on a lot of different hats to make a difference. For the simple fact, I have six boys. And I am trying my best to enlighten these young men to follow suit, make a difference, because again, 
all of us in this room, we are not guaranteed to see 50 or 100 years, but you want to definitely leave that, that stamp, that, that understanding that I've spread my knowledge to my youth in order to bring about natural selection in the sense that I want to enlighten them so they also can be enlightened individuals. How do I, as a leader, constantly motivate others to do the same as I'm mm -hmm. doing, basically? Because a lot of people, I don't know what it is, I'm, I understand they're not motivated because they believe the system is what it is. I have countless people that come to my barbershop and said, you know what, I'm not going to vote because it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening, I'm like, are you for real? Mm -hmm. You know, so I want to ask the question with all these different situations that we're dealing with, how do us individuals constantly try to motivate people to, 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 to look to make a difference? How can me as an individual also constantly motivate others and how can we spread this word and how could we more or less show them the bigger picture so they could like evolve from that mental state of, you know, it is what it is, we can't do anything about it. I want to know how we could help enlighten others more and more and help them to change that, 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 that constant stagnant way of thought concerning healthcare in general because that is a big topic, you know what I'm saying? Even when concerning mental health yep. is a big issue. And I was telling Marilyn the other day, I had to take a time out from school because I, I went to LIU, I went to City Tech, and now with my business, it's so difficult to finish my degree. And, but I want to change my whole focus now to mental health because it's, it's big. And we're not, we're not being helped. Yep. And I want my kids to look outside my barbershop every minute, like, who's this madman? No, 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 it's not about that. People have issues and stuff that they've been through to bring them to where they're at. They didn't, they didn't just come about being like that. So I need to find out what could we do to help educate our young ones more by them looking at us and learning and what are the resources are there to help our community on Flatbush and Extra Circle. Okay. Thank yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, and so I'm going I'm to take it in three parts. The, um, so, so let me be, let me say this. Motivation is, that's a hard one, right? And I would say that it is very difficult to be consistently under um, social, economic pressure, be disenfranchised consistently, and then have hope, right? So, um, and so keep hope alive, right? Um, I, I think that's really important, um, but I also think that can be kind of cliche. Right, and so what, when I talk about structures, one of the things I'm interested in is how do we provide access and structures to those people who have lost hope, because part of the reason they've lost hope is because of the ways in which those, the structures and resources have been taken away from them. I'm gonna move this like this, okay. So, the, um, so, so, so I would say that. Th that's my first point. The second point I would say is Though, how do we motivate, which is where you started, other leaders and people who are in the work? And maybe, uh, like on Monday and Tuesday, I was doing really well. Uh, Wednesday, not so well last week. By Thursday and Friday, I saw Stacey Abrams and Michelle Obama was better, right? So, like, so depending on the week, right? So how do we keep that motivation going? And I think this is crucial to have community and to create community. And when I say create community, sometimes what we do is create community with people who are constantly um, complaining. Yes, thank you, that's the right word. And, um, and so then, right, really bringing people who are positive. So when I think about the work, right, I try to show up when I'm even feeling not so great, when I'm talking to youth groups, etc. I try to come really positively. And when I'm talking to my other leaders, I try to say to them, right, hey, you might be having a bad day, but guess what? We got paid today. So let's make somebody else's life better, right? I have a sign in my house that says, what can I do today to make someone else's life better? 
And that's motivating. And then to motivate someone else, right? Because we, what we also know, and we know this from research, people don't get satisfaction. There's, right, okay, well, let me wait before I say this. There's a threshold. You have to make a certain amount of money, actually. It's, about, it's, it's, a, it's a poverty threshold, right? It's a little bit above poverty. So you have to make a certain amount of money. But after that, after that money doesn't determine hap happiness, right? It's about what you're giving back and how you're engaging your family, your community, et cetera. Right? And so when I'm talking to other leaders, I try to motivate them by saying, if you've moved into this leadership role, if you've moved into these spaces, if you're feeling like you're not getting the sustenance, sustenance that you need, where are those sites that can fill you with that sustenance? Right? And those are different kinds of questions. But I don't always ask those questions of the people who write, they've been fired from their job for the sixth time. Their mother and father were shot, right? I don't say to those people, keep hope alive. I say, let's work together to change the structures. And since I have more power right now, I'm going to work a little harder. Mental health and depression. I cannot say enough about mental health issues and depression, and particularly uh, across communities where people have been disenfranchised consistently. These are issues and these are structural issues that we really need to be paying attention to. One of the things that I was really, uh, it's funny, um, my um, hairstylist is a nurse. Two for one. See, I really try to go for things, right? Um, I mean, really, she is a nurse. I go to her basement. She like checks my moles on my neck and then does my hair. And so we, <laughs> so we really do need to think about, see, I, I really think about building community. So we really do need to think about, right, and then she asked me questions about my mental health. Like, Lisa, how are you today? You have a stressful life and a stressful job. You travel. You have 13 different countries you have to go to. Have you slept? Sometimes she makes me tea. Right? You have to find those people who will be helpful, but we also have to think about our own mental health and self-care. I cannot say enough about self-care. So when I see leaders, the other thing I really try to talk to them about is self-care. I don't always practice it. I'm not always good at it. I'm jet-lagged right now, but I really do try to talk about that and how we can be better. What I know about people of color, and particularly women, is we will exhaust ourselves for others, and we don't often take care of ourselves. And so I really try to put myself in a community where people will check in on me and then also I check in on others. Mental health issues in the black and brown communities are really um, of great concern to me. Actually my dissertation w uh, was focused on this and um, what I will say here is that I think that we, there has not been enough attention across time and space if we think about the psychiatric and psychological profession and particularly the ways in which um, the stressors that um, impact people of color have been misdiagnosed or not diagnosed um, correctly in those professions. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be do, done there. And if we think about the psychiatric and psychological professions, we see depressed numbers in terms of people of color and women. And so that's another area where we could see a lot more need for diversification. Thank I know you. that was a long-winded no, answer. No, no, but thank you. Thank you. We have, um, so speaking of mental health, um, we have Dr. Patu. Um, he has a question. That's oh, yes. my psychiatrist uh, and I'm a researcher. Thank you very much. Uh, and I can't agree more with the things you've really brought to us. Uh, and a number of things struck me. You know, I'm an immigrant. I came from Portugal. And my mother was brought up in Greenwich Village. She had gone there. We came here. And when, I, when we immigrated here in 1963, my mother said, you know, maybe you want to switch your name from Carlos to Carl or to Charles, and I said, no way. And I've lived with the name issue and so on. But I'm a psychiatrist, I'm the former dean of the College of Medicine here, and I'm also a geneticist. And so one of the things I wanted to sort of expand in what you're saying, so in no way contradicting, what I think we, in the importance of showing how similar, how alike we are, we forget that from a health perspective, Sometimes it's the tiniest of differences that are truly critical. 
So for instance, you have a cell that mutates in one out of three billion base pairs, and it can mutate into a cancer. It's still your cell, but it can have a tremendous health consequence. And one of the things that our communities, the communities that we so need to serve, sometimes don't understand, is that one of the disparities they suffer is that not enough work, not enough dollars have actually been spent in understanding those tiny, tiny differences. And because of that, in, the, in an era of precision medicine, we lose that ability to be precise, to really deliver the care that each of our patients deserve once you get away from the Eurocaucasian mass that has been studied. And so I just want to throw, it's less of a question than sort of carrying on here, but make that point that that is something that we need to address in an understanding way, not because of how different we are, but because it is so critical to the care we give the individual. And the fact that from the genomic point of view, we're all admixed, we're all mixtures. So what you are at a particular point that's relevant to a health issue, you're not gonna know based on what you look like or your name or your history necessarily. I actually couldn't agree more, and I think that that was my point about the research in terms of the cadavers and the kind of research that's been done historically, right, and really thinking about the new avenues of research. And I'm, I, I heard the word earlier, incubation used, and, and really thinking about new sites of, of incubation. And it's funny, I was, I was just two weeks ago, I was at, um, I, I do a lot of STEM and technology work and, and I, um, I'm, I'm very interested in medical and telehealth and so I was um, at a, what is called a solution hackathon, it was for people who were coming up with um, uh, medical applications on the phone. And the group that won actually was uh, two young men, they were 16 and 17 years old, and they came up with an app that you can use on your phone to take a picture of the mole on your skin to determine whether or not it might have uh, malignant tendencies. And they had run it through various schema across brown and black bodies. As you all know, that there have been, there's lots of misdiagnoses in these areas in terms of melanoma and moles. So it was a, a very interesting moment. And, and precisely to your point, right, the specific targeted sort of issue of thinking about differences in terms of how uh, melanoma and those kinds of cancers appear. So thank you very much for your comment. Just to add, I'm the other Dr. Patu, oh, yeah. and we do this work together. And the way we've really been successful in getting people of African ancestry to participate in our genetic studies is going to them face to face and talking to them as each other, as people who care about each other's health. And we've had a lot of success in recruiting people that way. Um, and so there's good news in this, because this, this message does come through, as does yours. Thank you. Dr. Stryker? Uh, there's here, Dr. Stryker. and there's a woman back there in the hat. There's That's one here, sorry. and then a woman back there. Yes, I see you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, wonderful talk. Um, I had a question about your con conceptualization that it takes three generations for populations that immigrate to experience what people who've been here for a long time. Let me, let me just be clear. When I say that, what I meant by that is it's not that the people who immigrate won't have experiences, it's that the full immersion experience of what it means to be and differentiate it from that cultural experience usually takes about three generations. And that part of that has to do with the immigration patterns in the United States, and that goes back to banking and where people get to live, quite frankly. One of the thoughts I had about it so from a social perspective, is that in that three generations, it may be that certain people who migrate here get away from those things that made them strong to get here in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, that's a whole nother discussion, but I think um, the way that people confront difference and, and, and being here, et cetera, may be different mm -hmm. at the beginning than Abs in the third generation. That's yeah. absolutely right. And that you've, you've hit on the point exactly that how you might, as you 
immigrate and how you might navigate once you immigrate is very different than how you would navigate after you've been here. And I'll give you an interesting tidbit, and it'll be interesting, I, I don't know, you know, three generations from now, who knows where I'll be. Um, but what we know right now is the most success, successful immigrant population to the U.S., immigrant populations are from Africa right now. Meaning, and what, by measures of success, housing, banks, uh, access to resources, etc. And so those are the most successful immigrants today. What that will look like generationally will be interesting because will they have the experiences of third generations, right, from now having those experiences of what it means to be um, quote unquote black as it has, as it has been. Um, but we don't, we, we don't have that data yet. The changing demographics of the United States, et cetera, suggest hopefully that that might shift and we're seeing some of that in some populations, but not to the, not to the degree that we would hope. Yes. Hello, I'm Hello. Cynthia Charlton, and Hello. beautiful, absolutely. But this is about name. I made a, uh, I, was, I was talking to um, someone over the phone, and I grew up in England, and uh, my name, and I introduced myself as Cynthia Charlton to him. And we had a discussion, and I had to meet at the office. And when I got to the office, I sa I, he said, Cynthia Charlton, and I stood up. He says, oh, you're black. I said, yes, always. Mm. So name. <laughs> <laughs> name does make a difference. So that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. I mean, that's, that is classic. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. Really, this was a wonderful talk. We've come full circle. And I think one of the things that you highlight is as we move forward um, as SUNY Downstate, the only academic medical center in Brooklyn, Arthur Ashe Institute, Brooklyn Health Disparities, that research really has to be comprehensive, um, engage our community leaders as the healthcare hair technician, um, make sure that we're speaking with our genetics, um, genomics, researchers and um, also our community partners to make sure that research is done equitably and, and it um, addresses the needs of all populations. So thank you so much for this inspiring talk. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Again, I'd like to thank both Dr. Lisa Coleman and Dr. Carla Booten Foster for that presentation. This is heavy. <laughs> So we've come to the end of our program. I thank you all for being here. I thank you all for celebrating with us our 26th anniversary, and we look forward to celebrating many more with you all. And we just thank you for taking the time out of your day to spend these hours with us. I'd like to thank all of our board members that are in the room. I'd like to thank my former CEO, Dr. Ruth Brown, for our continuous support. And I'd like to thank everyone for just taking the time, our students that participated today, our hair technician, so that's I have to remember that. <laughs> And now Barbara, hair technician, and our stylist that all participated. And we have lunch outside for you, and you have a time that you could network and talk to each other. So thank you once again. Happy anniversary to us, and, and we look forward to many more.